Hey everybody, I'm back. All right, today we've got chapter nine, The Man in the Jippa Joppa Hat. Super short chapter, only three pages, so this is gonna be a really quick read for this one today. All right, here we go. Here's the picture with that chapter. That's a Jippa Joppa hat, kind of a big floppy hat. It was about a week before Praiseworthy and Jack reached the diggings. They had caught the four o'clock riverboat at the end of the long wharf the next day. Dr. Buckby had come to see them off, and he was staying behind in San Francisco. I'm going to wait for that cut eye Higgins, he said. He's bound to turn up with my map. I'll meet every single ship that comes in, and I will get my hands on that scoundrel and get my map back. That night, in their stateroom, Jack polished his horn spoon. Praiseworthy had let him buy it on the wharf with a pinch of gold dust. Finally, Jack tucked it inside his belt and looked at himself in the mirror. He had lacked what he, all he lacked was his red flannel shirt and a floppy hat. A beard, though, was out of the question, at least for the time being for the boy. He glanced at Praiseworthy. He wondered what his partner would look like with whiskers grown out and revol revolver in his belt. Praiseworthy was tall as Quartz Jackson and as straight as an awning post. There were even sun creases now forming at the corners of his eyes. Yes, sir, Jack thought, Praiseworthy would make a fine-looking gent in a beard. Their adventure in barbering had paid expenses nice and richly. There was even gold dust left over, and Praiseworthy had poured it into the little fingers of his white glove. For safekeeping, of course. He had made a list of the gold camps the miners had bandied about as he had cut their hair. Chilly Gulch and Grizzly Flats and Timbuktu, he muttered. They sound like dreadful places to take a growing boy. They sounded glorious to Jack. Don't worry about me, Praiseworthy. I can handle it. I am thinking of your Aunt Arabella, said Praiseworthy. What would she think if you write to her from a place named Bedbug or Whiskey Flats or Hangtown? Angel Camp, now that one she might approve of. But they say it's a fearful place. Now let me see. There's Rough and Ready. There's You Bet, and there's Humbug, not to mention Rawhide, Roaring Camp, and Cutthroat. All good places. What'll it be, Master Jack? One place sounds as bloodthirsty as the next. Let's go to Hangtown, said Jack. Then Hangtown it is, said Praiseworthy. The following morning, Jack saw Indians for the very first time in his life. They came to the banks of the river to watch the crowded boat and listen to the ringing of the pilot house bell, Jack stared back in fascination. Wouldn't his sisters, Constance and Sarah, be frightened of them? But that night, when the flat-bottom riverboat got stuck on a sandbar, Jack felt a little uneasy himself. What if the savages came aboard when the passengers were asleep and helped themselves to a few scalps? Stuff and nonsense, Praiseworthy smiled, shaving himself in the cabin mirror. The steward tells me that they're digger Indians, quite tame. They dig for roots and acorns and are a menace to nothing but wasps and grasshoppers, which they consider a delicacy. With one sandbar and another, it was two days before the Sacramento City came into view. A shore cannon went off, raising a cloud of dust to announce the arrival of the boat. The townspeople flocked to the river, and Praiseworthy and Jack carried their picks and shovels and gold pans and carpet bags through the crowds. It was the end of June, and the valley shimmered with heat. Wood awnings stretched over the storefronts like eye shades, and as they walked along, Jack kept gazing at the mountains, the great Sierra Nevadas. They stood dark blue and purple against the hot morning sky. That must be where the gold was, Jack thought. Fresh hope shot through him. They were almost there, weren't they? A stage was leaving for the mines at two o'clock. To raise their fare, the butler and the boy had no choice but to sell off a pick and shovel. Mining tools were in great demand and the prices were astonishing. Each pick and shovel brought in $100 each. After paying their stage fare, Praiseworthy poured the gold dust left into the tips of all five fingers of his left glove. He had difficulty getting his hand in too, but he made it in. His left hand was as heavy as an anvil. The dust was their grub stake and he had no intention of losing it to some rascals along the way. We ought to carry a gun, praiseworthy, Jack said, a four-shooter. There's no time for that now, Master Jack. They were the last passengers to board the stagecoach. 
excuse me, they had hardly taken their seats when the driver, a bony legged, ban sorry, a bandy legged old man in buckskins snapped his whip. The horses bolted off and they were off to the diggings. Jack was squeezed in beside Praiseworthy and a red faced man wearing a string tie. He was quick to introduce himself as the undertaker. Fletcher's the name, gentlemen, Jonas T. Fletcher of Hangtown. I don't mind telling you business is brisk in my line of work up there in the diggings. Glad to meet you, yes, sir, socially or professionally, as the case may be. In the seat opposite sat two, sat two Frenchmen in brand new jackboots and checkered shirts with the creases still in them. Between them and opposite Jack, to their knees, almost touching, sat a man in a dusty linen suit with his hat pulled down way over his face. He had been sleeping that way from the moment that Praiseworthy and Jack had entered, entered the stagecoach. I don't see how a man can sleep on this road, Jonas T. Fletcher had laughed. Maybe the man's dead. Ain't that a fine looking jippa joppa hat he's got on? Must have bought that in Panama. I come across a plains myself, clear from Missouri. Jonas T. Fletcher droned on and on. The horse, team of horses raised red clouds of dust, and Jack watched the passing sights as best he could. They overtook an ox-drawn wagon loaded with stores for the miners and the string of pack mules. A man in the, fi the, man in the fine straw jippa joppa hat just slept on. A large ruby ring was glistening from his finger. With the jostling of the stagecoach, his coat fell open and Jack could see the butt of a dueling pistol tucked inside his belt. It was almost an hour before he awoke. His hand rested on the pistol. He tipped back his hat off his face and looked straight into Jack's eyes. <clears throat> and with the faintest of smiles, he had been, hadn't been asleep at all. And Jack very nearly jumped out of his skin. Because who was that man in the Jippa Joppa hat? It was Mr. Cut Eye Higgins. And that's the end of that chapter. Very short. I hope you enjoyed it. There's that scoundrel, Cut Eye Higgins, back into our story. He's going to be there some more. Bye. <laughs>